Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the James D Podcast Record Club, where each week one of us recommends an album to listen to, and everybody else has to listen to it, and then we fucking review it. And this week we're talking about Morgan's recommended album, which is Depeche Mode's Songs of Faith and Devotion. Why are we talking about Songs of Faith and Devotion? Well, uh, recently, Depeche Mode keyboardist, soundscapist, Andy Fletcher passed away, instrumental member of Depeche Mode for their entire tenure. And it's a hole in the band that exists now that can never be replaced. So figured we would commemorate him and his work with one of the absolute peaks of Depeche Mode's career. Sort of in the middle of a kind of career long peak of them just putting out like absolute banger after absolute banger. Mm. So anyone who watches the series regularly will know that we do like to talk about, you know, a mixture of both, you know, incredibly acclaimed records and more sort of under discussed or underlooked records and songs of faith and devotion to be clear is not uh, an overlooked album. It's a very beloved record, but it does, I think, stand in the shadow a little bit of violator, the record that came before it. Uh, the the band's biggest and most beloved record commercially, critically, all of the above, that record rocketed Depeche Mode into the stratosphere after a good decade of grinding to get to that point. And Songs of Faith and Devotion, and one of the things that's interesting about that is that if you look at the band sort of interviews or stories that have been told about the, the construction of that album, it was quite a kind of harmonious and sort of beautifully organic experience. And Songs of Faith and Devotion, the album we're going to talk about today, is actually was quite acrimonious to create and record. There was a lot of constriction and pressure and also difficulty reconciling creative differences and just roles within the band as well. And one of the things that has to be remarked about Andrew Fletcher, who's absolutely the most undervalued and underappreciated member of a band where just about every member was kind of like, you know, a a name that everyone knew, like a recognizable figure. Fletch was kind of overlooked because he was sort of the everyman. He was kind of the Ed O'Brien of the band. If you want to draw a Radiohead comparison. Uh, he was someone who gets comparatively less shine, but if you were to take him out of the equation, you would immediately realize that so much was missing that defined what this band is. I mean, you think about who Depeche Mode are, you think about the kind of music they make, this sort of rock music that is, well, not even really, it's it's primarily synth pop, right? But it has this heavy industrial rock infused tonality to it. And it has ever since the mid eighties and, and that kind of, that, synthesis uh with records like uh, music for the masses and black celebration uh, and of course violator right that 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 reached a kind of fever pitch and you saw the you know influences of that bleeding into artists like nine inch nails for instance Trent Reznor. if you listen to a pretty hate machine like the biggest and most obvious influence on a record like that is depeche mode right is the, their mid-80s records and so it was a certain point where once Depeche Mode reached this sort of nexus of popularity with Violator and they had inspired these acts that were kind of then following in their stead and doing interesting new things with pop structures and industrial sound palettes, Depeche Mode were kind of no longer sort of ahead of the curve, but we're now just kind of like a part of the curve, like we're a part of the wave now. Their contemporaries were beginning to sort of have a similar level of fame and of recognition to what they were going through, but they were still pretty big. And Songs of Faith and Devotion, I would say, is really the last big canonical event Depeche Mode album from a commercial standpoint. Certainly not their last great record, but a record that, again, stands so much in the shadow of Violator and, and also is kind of so dwarfed by its biggest songs, tracks like uh walking in my shoes and in your room of course that i feel like the arc of the entire album and even the kind of concept that's so clearly spelt out in the title is kind of a little bit overlooked right there is so much to this record that i think while it's still a beloved album that has a lot of love and was commercially very successful 
it is still a record that I feel like isn't really discussed enough. I mean, it's a record that led to uh, Alan Wilder quitting, one of the band's sort of key members as well. So it is the kind of the end of an era for Depeche Mode and one of their most maximal and, and invigorating records. Like, obviously, Violator is a maximal record too, but when I think about that record, it also, it's about half of it is maximal and the rest, the other half of it is quite kind of low-key and sort of moody and, and sort of emotive, whereas this is, for the most part, much more on the harder edge side of things with a couple of, of, of more paired back songs that I think personally are more successful than the paired back songs on Violator but nevertheless here we are this is also coming out in 93 as well another thing you have to kind of uh, acknowledge is that this is a record where the band's sort of industrial synth pop crossed with rock style is starting to become is starting to be recontextualized by the rise of the grunge wave, right? And this album, which came out in March of 93, kind of arrived, if you think about it, really at the peak of the grunge wave, like around the time where uh, a lot of those canonical grunge records had been released, but some of them weren't really kind of blowing up the charts until 93. So this record arrives in a particular landscape culturally, and it's particularly well suited to that because it has a lot of darkness and it has a lot of darker, sludgier textures. It has a lot of uh, abrasive and more unfriendly uh, tones to it. And the subject matter as well, this idea of the degrading nature of worship feels like it's kind of, it fits in with a lot of the sort of punk and rebellious, you know, themes and ideas of the grunge wave as well of, you know, of, of, kind of killing the past and of, of this kind of nihilistic sensibility almost and not to mention good old heroin yeah and, and heroin <laughs> for sure but that said it's produced with flood who produced violator so there's still a good deal of connective tissue that it's still it's not too haywire to completely alienate anyone who's into this band um but yeah this is i think a record that you know, deserves more appreciation for how ugly it is in the most exciting of ways, even for this band. Like it just, it just, it's an intimidating record to listen to at certain points as well, but it's also a record that can be very beautiful. What do you guys think of this album and, and um, where it sort of ranks or, or stands in the Depeche Mode catalog? Personally, I've only heard two Depeche Mode albums, so I can't really speak to it contextually, but I think your mention of Flood is really important to sort of set the stage too, as being like, Flood's a dude who, uh, he's like, production work is really long, really storied. He's worked with acts as old as uh, Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, and uh, with contemporaries of Depeche Mode's like uh, the Smashing Pumpkins on something like a door which I think is a very like sonically comparable record and how they take a uh, band's sort of fundamental aspects and sort of really layer on the, the atmosphere of a very kind of basic sort of industrial synth pop sound. I also think that this is in terms of like where it ranks in terms of like the canon of popular music is that I think this holds a similar spot to maybe like a synth electronic industrial contemporary at this point at least band and that would be Nine Inch Nails is that this if Violator is comparable to something like uh, the Downward Spiral then I would say Songs of Faith and Devotion would be comparable to The Fragile where its peaks in popularity certainly stand out to people who are familiar with the band but the terms of like the connective tissue of the album it doesn't really really, you know, get talked about a whole lot. And the sort of dark aspect, I think, that is lent to this band's sound is definitely linked to that production. But I think the most distinct part of Depeche Mode for me has always been Dave Gahan. Dude's voice is just 1000% super iconic. And his vocal performances, specifically on this album, I think are fantastic because they are 
far from understated. In fact, I think they're quite emotionally overbearing, which is why a lot of the content on this album feels so kind of ugly and depressive. But they're nonetheless, that darkness is always present in his really, really emotive performances all across here from songs like Walking in My Shoes to my actual favorite song on here, which I don't know if this was like used in something as to why I have the affinity for this song because no one else I know has like talked about it as being a highlight, but my favorite song on here is actually Condemnation, which is a weird kind of synthy dirge of a track. It, it's got this really like the whole songs of faith and devotion concept. It feels like a, like a dark church hymnal. Uh, and I just, I love how Gahan just like takes the syllables at the end of these lines and just drags them out really slowly and kind of cracks his own voice uh, the further on he goes into the song. And it really just like goes to show you like right after Walking in My Shoes too, is that that's a song that's sort of written from the perspective of somebody who's just sort of like looking down on, on someone else for their like inability to understand or relate to or just sort of approach them on levels of like power or like love or you know devotion or what have you so I think the emotional content of this album is simultaneously like really striking but also since it's not talked about it's just sort of taken for granted I guess just because this album songs you know the, the couple songs on it are so popular that they just sort of get absorbed into pop culture and you know it the actual themes of the record are kind of taken for granted. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I'm not surprised you love condemnation. I mean, like the, cause especially considering how much like neoclassical dark wave you're talking about having listened to recently, like it's got a real yes! sort of like dead can dancey sort of uh, vibe to it. Like it's just the way it delivers the condemnation yeah just like and then eventually the why yeah i mean it's a classic it's song so it's gone's best vocal performance and he damn in right discography he said as much i believe he i saw an interview quote where he said that that's the vocal performance he's most proud of in his career and yeah. understandably so it's it's a real labored but and pained but also like in ways yeah. that work like he, he, he yeah and he has a, a, a particular voice as well like i've always loved how Gayan sounds like Gayan. Gahan sounds like <laughs> dead serious. Like he's gonna fucking murder you with every single line he ever delivers. Like he sounds like it's just a particular vocal tonality and style that he's had that has Venom. always it's always resonated with me since I was a little kid because I've been listening to Depeche Mode or I've been hearing Depeche Mode since I was really, really young. Like they're one of my dad's favorite bands, and this is a record that he loves as well. And I think one of the reasons I really gravitate towards it is that as opposed to something like music for the masses or something, uh, I, I feel like his gravity, his intent, his seriousness is particularly well suited to the, the themes of worship that he explores here. And I also think that they're explored in ways that are a little bit more interesting and a little bit less two dimensional than they have been in the past where, because Gahan has always been like interested in like the the hollowness of celebrity and the ways in which the commercialization of art the commodification of art you know kind of renders it all disgusting and he uses like the language of debauchery I guess to kind of like make commentary on the sort of pop ecosystem I suppose it works more often than it doesn't frankly for me but it sort of is the kind of thing where I feel like he would get better throughout the 80s and into the 90s at writing songs around that that weren't so shallow or didn't sometimes feel as shallow as the things they were critiquing and here I think is where Gahan really nails that like especially in songs like uh, In Your Room and I Feel You and Walking in My Shoes and um, even some of the deeper cuts on this record as well in fact this is the thing that I think really separates this for me is that Depeche Mode are a god tier singles band and they're also a god tier singles band that do still happen to have a number of great records but still a lot of the time uh, I mean this is my thing with Violator which is a great album but to me like I most of the time when I want to listen to that I want to listen to 
uh, the singles and the big tracks more so than the deep cuts. Whereas I think uh, songs of faith and devotion, uh, along with like Black Celebration and um, yeah, really those two records, are, I think the most um, consistently me where I, I am actually getting as much out of the deep cuts as I am out of the singles. Like one of my absolute favorite songs here, uh, just because I find the whole sonic landscape that the band sort of lay out here and Fletcher is a huge part of this is Judas in the midpoint of this record. Yeah, I love oh, this yeah. song. I love how expansive it sounds. I love how measured Gahan's vocal performance is for him on this album and he has a really great way of of again stretching out lines and and imbuing things with a a sort of potent gravity without necessarily leaning into melodrama although there are moments on this record where he gets kind of melodramatic and i'm feeling it like i've always really really enjoyed the one particular deep cut on this record uh one caress the second last song here which is sort of like this stripped back song that has this very sort of like cinematic string arrangement and it's just so you know gahan is the focal point so strongly here um but there's also you know songs like mercy in you and rush that i think are really underrated as well that he sells so well with his more sort of intense uglier brand of personality but like i put this album on the car stereo and i feel you and walking in my shoes hit back to back and it's just a fucking ride like this record sounds fantastic and i love the whole sense of the way that it's structured the way that it flows as well in your room genuinely i think is one of their best singles ever i would put it up there with the yeah. best singles on violator this song to me there was a time i think when this was my favorite depeche mode song and i don't think it is now but it's definitely top three for me i i definitely I, my favorite I, single i i just absolutely fucking adore this song I, I i love the the heft of it as well like the heft of the drums on this are so just slamming and hard hitting especially coming after a song like judas and in a record where the band are not afraid to kind of dip into this more atmospheric sound at certain points a couple things worth noting about that as well music video for that song was a real notable moment for the band great video directed by their mainstay anton Corb- 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 one of the fucking goat music video directors yeah but that was a real moment for the band because early on when work started on this album dave gone had been living in la and i think everybody else was uh back in england and if not england at least europe i think uh so they hadn't seen each other for a while so the first time that they saw each other to start work on this gone was I ch- i'm gonna try to remember i think it was martin gore's words he said he looked like tatted up and strung out, like just looked yeah. like a completely different person because he was throughout the making of this record and much of the touring of it, uh, Gone was in the throes of a, of a heroin addiction that had a very powerful hold over him, which in turn led into the next record, Ultra, being a sort of what I think of as a detox record. Uh, sort of mm-hmm. sobriety record but not in the sense of like shape and destroy by rustin kelly being a sobriety record and mm. more of a like i am going through the withdrawals type of record well he almost died i'm pretty sure like yeah he- that's that's what i'm with this uh in your room music video they thought the filming of that video was going to be the last time they ever saw him because i think it was i think he overdosed on tour for this album and the making of that video came during that tour or during a break for touring this album they thought this was it for him pretty much so it was a very haunting experience for the band in general and came very close to sort of either ending or at least heavily altering the career trajectory of this band and the song itself carries that weight sonically in so many ways especially on the music video mix that they used i think called the zephyr mix on most releases of this album it's a little bit more intense and instrumentally 
uh, forthright than uh, the album cut. Uh, both are as good as each other, I think. Yeah, Condemnation, definitely way up there in terms of deeper cuts. Uh, I also love Mercy and You a lot. Mm -hmm. I think the way that that song gradually builds, it starts pretty intensely, and then the way it builds into like... Dude, those guitars at the start are like fucking... God, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And by the time it reaches its climax, and Gon's basically screaming, pleading in this really religious reverence kind of way it fits in perfectly with the rest of the record Mm. um i also want to note this album tour cycle had a concert film also directed by anton corbin called devotional and it's not as artistically done as something like stop making sense but i think it is like just as exhilarating of a watch it's also in a similar place for the band's career compared to where the talking heads were for Stop Making Sense, just at pretty much the absolute peak of their powers and delivering one of the best concert films I've ever seen. And particularly it is because Gon is so fully embodied this sort of strung out, sleazy persona for those live shows that it really brings an incredible energy to it and plus it's really it's good to see alan wilder at the peak of his powers as well Mm. he he plays drums like a physical drum kit on i feel you on that concert film and they sound like it's the loudest thing you've ever heard Mm. yeah uh, that's all very important i think to understand contextually in terms of interpreting the record as well because i've talked about how gan is sort of written through this kind of commentary on you know the the bleakness of of existing in a kind of heavily commercialized artistic landscape but also like you can read just about all of these songs and the whole devotion theme as being about heroin addiction right like absolutely yeah. And I think in your room, one of the reasons why that is one of the greatest songs um, that he ever wrote is that, I mean, it it's so powerful, no matter how you want to read it, without being so vague as to apply to anything either. Like the the lines are just the lyrics here in your room where time stands still or moves at your will. Will you let the morning come soon or will you leave me lying here in your favorite darkness, your favorite half light? There's just some real like just seedy ugly tragedy to the song hanging on your words living on your breath feeling with your skin will i always be here you can totally see how uh, gahan will has influenced someone like trent reznor as well like his fingerprints are all over pretty hate machine and downward spiral and i'm sure part of the reason why reznor wanted to work with flood on both of those records there is a particular brand of this kind of like uh, ugly, synthetic, hard-edged rock music about the horrors of heroin addiction, essentially, that has this particular sort of slick pop sensibility that's almost like using pop in a subversive way to kind of like postmodernly highlight, I guess, the ugliness of it all that Nine Inch Nails and Depeche Mode both at their commercial peak were doing in a way that was so just so unfriendly but also so confronting and so bold and so well fitting to the you know the landscape of the time commercially with the grunge wave that it couldn't be ignored that regardless of how unfriendly it was, it still did numbers commercially. It still hit the charts. You still got these iconic and memorable music videos that represented the the peak of the music video art form as well. You know, this is the era of people like David Fincher coming to to power. I mean, it's people forget that Fincher made music videos before he made movies. And he absolutely came from that Corbin sort of school where you give a kind of grandeur to the seediness of this particular world and landscape of rock music at this point in history 
and it's not really all that similar to the grunge wave because it's so much it's based people the people who are doing it are so much older than that and they're also the cultural context is so much different especially but it really is a showcase for what a a, a dark time for pop music this was of course not in terms of quality but just in terms of like theme and sound and ideas and it also makes i would argue the pivot away from these sorts of trends in pop music in the late 90s and early 2000s all the more glaring like when we think of some of the most saccharine like i'm reading tom bryan's column the number ones on stereo gum where he goes through every number one song of all time and he's in the late 90s at the moment and so many of them in the late 90s are just the most kind of like sappy lame sort of like really regrettable songs and so much of that existed and and as a reaction and as a response to uh how popular and how big all of all of this stuff was and it it really doesn't get much darker than this than this album which just arrived at the right time like if they had released this instead of violator in 1990 i'm sure it probably would have been basically as big as that album but coming as the follow-up to a skyscrapingly huge record it's almost like just too much of a to- of a dose of the darkness that i can see why it's maybe a little bit more overlooked because it's so dour and so difficult at points and again like when you listen to a song like condemnation i mean it's and it's a painful thing to listen to because you can hear that Gahan might well be shattering his vocal cords any second now and that he is singing from a place of true despondence and it's a dynamic you just you seldom get I think in this kind of pop music and it's it's it makes it really special and it makes it's one of the things that made Depeche Mode so special. I think the word that we might be looking for here is gothic yeah uh, which blood you know Nick Cave, Gothic Rock. We we have you know Smashing Pumpkins. We have Adore. But the one noticeable influence and contemporary, I think that's highly comparable in terms of that sort of sound that we were going for. Uh, another uh, band that is in the midst of their commercial peak right here, just because they were about to have their biggest hit of their entire career in the mid '90s, and that's The Cure. I think a lot of their uglier sounding records, a lot of their stuff that's a little bit more post-punky and gothy, a little bit less ornate than the kind of dream poppy stuff that's on Disintegration and more the uglier shit that's on stuff like pornography or even Head on the Door is also is highly influential and absolutely at peace with the kind of music that they're making here, which made it, I think, the most commercially viable that it would ever be at this Mm. point. Yeah, it's interesting how you think about that. The Cure were kind of veering away from that darkness at this point, even as early as Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me. And Disintegration is obviously a dark record as well, but it's a beautiful sounding album. Mm-hmm. Whereas, yeah, the 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 infusion of industrial sounds into these sorts of bands was not a trend that they followed particularly, but they were the precursors to it all as well. So that's the flip side. Worth noting as well, I think that uh, the primary lyricist on this album and most Depeche Mode albums uh, is actually Martin Gore, who is sort of, it's probably anything but an accident uh, because it's so hard to view something like In Your Room as anything other than him adopting Gon's perspective about his addiction uh, from an almost, the song is written in first person but it it still maintains a sort of third person watching something terrible happen to your friend in slow motion mm-hmm. kind of tone uh, and that in particular I think permeates the entire album and really adds a, a whole another layer of sort of downtroddenness to this and it's interesting because these two deep cuts that i love that are the most stripped back things here judas and one caress are the songs that gore sings and yeah it is like you can even see a song like judas is almost being like him singing to dave to a certain extent like 
it's both a song about the throes of addiction and how you throw yourself into that, but also a song that kind of, uh, like when he says that, you know, don't just stand there and shout it, do something about it. Like, uh, if you want my yeah. love, like there's, there's levels and layers to the devotional theme and the way that it's expressed here. But in a lot of ways, it does kind of feel like more so than any other point on the record, a kind of reaching out moment. And the one caress is kind of the inverse of that because it's, it's like, you know, being at your lowest and kind of looking deeper into the darkness. But I think I really appreciate Judas because of how emotionally complicated that song is. It's both a song about uh, choosing to surrender, but also a song about trying to pull yourself out at the same time. It's a, it's a, it's a complicated and messy song and it just comes together beautifully with such a sparse and, and, and atmospheric arrangement. You know who else this reminds me of as well? Like just looking at a song like Higher Love and some of those lyrics about I can taste more than feel. The burning inside is so real. Like that's obviously, very obviously a lyric that evokes heroin and drug addiction. My soul's on fire as well. This reminds me a lot of like spiritualized, uh, but like early spiritualized yeah. uh, and even like Space Men 3, which was the band that Jason Pierce was in before spiritualized as well, which wrote a lot of songs that were, about heroin addiction and about God at the same time. And they would do that and they would write these very sort of straightforward, like gospel influenced sort of hymnal songs with sort of screeching, howling guitar feedback solos on top of them. And that whole thing that Space Men 3 did, uh, and then that had the way that that bled into spiritualized, super feels like. Uh, maybe not necessarily a precursor to this because it was happening in the late 80s, early 90s, but a compliment to this as well. Uh, and I don't really have a, a, a wider point with that, but it's just another example of this brand of music that I love. I mean, it's a low-hanging fruit to compare a rock band to the rock band, but I mean, it all goes back to the Velvet Underground. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Every generation of, you know, uh, every generation of rock bands are just, trying to do their own velvet underground and Nico john kale lou reed yeah. heroin and guitar feedback are the, the 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 central tenets of rock music yeah oh well should we do our favorite tracks and ratings then for songs of favorite, faith favorite and cats and ratings favorite cats this is my favorite you jake why don't you go favorite. first condemnations my favorite song on here uh you gotta give it up to Judas, a song I simply don't hear enough people talk about. And on the note of songs people don't talk about enough, I'll also say one caress. Uh, absolutely a, a deep cut favorite of mine. Uh, least favorite, maybe like, I don't really think anything on here is anything less than excellent. I do slightly prefer this album to Violator. Um, I just kind of like the, the looser. Violator is a more tight, fustier kind of album to me whereas I kind of like that this feels a little bit less impenetrable than that album does to me but uh I, I'll say that Get Right With Me is maybe the point on the album that I'm I'm least, I'm least with it even though that song is still really good um and I give the album a nine this is uh, probably one of my favorite albums of 1993 if I had to really think about it my favorite tracks I will say In Your Room walking in my shoes and condemnation uh least favorite if i really have to pick one it's probably eh, i mean i don't really have to pick one but for let's just, let's just say for the sake of the argument that i do i'll probably go with uh one caress which i again i like a fair bit but you know I, I also kind of think that its placement on the album is a little awkward. Uh, like, I kind of wish something with a bit more heft was the penultimate here. But, you know, anyway, yeah, and I will give, I will give this overall a nine and a half. I'm going to give my three favorite songs. Uh, In Your Room is absolutely number one. And then I think I'll put I Feel You. And then I think I'll put uh, Walking in My Shoes. I'm a basic fucking hoe. And I'm going to give this a... It's so... Mm, 
8.5. It's fucking close to a nine. It's really fucking close, but it's 8.5. Um, like, could that mainly just because I don't make my top three you know this album's good as fuck mainly because i think my least favorite track here which is get right with me is just a little bit less on the left than like everything else on the record it just feels a little bit extraneous yeah. but it's still a good song uh yeah really really love this album to bits it's my favorite depeche mode album um and i adore it my, my three favorite tracks on this album are in your room in your room, Zephyr mix. In your room, Apex mix. That gives us an average rating of 9.0 for Depeche Mode's Songs of Faith and Devotion. Let us know at home what you think of Depeche Mode's Songs of Faith and Devotion. Where would it rank in your Depeche Mode ranking? Feel free to drop that in the comments if you want to. Do you think it's one of their best records? Do you think it's a little bit overrated? What do you think of what we had to say? What do you think of our interpretations as well? Of course, let us know what this band means to you. And also, if you want to give any tributes to Fletch as well, they'd be appreciated in the comments below. We did do this specifically because of his passing, because it's we've never reviewed a Depeche Mode record before. And you know, there's never a, never a bad time to start. So let us know in the comments below what this means to you. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple, you can head on over to the YouTube link in the description and you can give us a like, leave us a comment there if you want to. If you aren't already, we'd appreciate it if you subscribe to the channel. If you enjoy the content, of course, and want to see more, uh, and there will be more, you can also hit the join button. And for just $1 a month, you can support the channel directly, become one of our besties, gain access to really cool emotes that I've recently updated, as well as getting priority comment response and your name at the start of every video on the channel. And if you want to recommend us a record to listen to, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. All of that for just $1 a month. It's a pretty good deal if you ask me. As always, though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, Oxycontin, you get me closer to God. <laughs>